couple of weeks ago, I set out on a journey to try and prove that I wasn't just some one-trick pony Diplo player, the easiest win con in the game without anything to show for it. And I won a culture game and a science game, first I've ever done. And not too long after that, lo and behold, I won a religious one too. Yay! So everything but domination is done. I don't know when that will be, but hopefully I'll get the opportunity, preferably with a Civ I find a little more comfortable to try and work with on that, but that's for another time. So, how did I win this game with Tamar, who is, to be fair, a pretty strong religious-based Civ? This religious game, let's have a look at her. Glory of the world, kingdom and earth, combat victories provide Faith equal to 50% of the combat strength of the defeated unit from stand of you know, on standard speed, but we're on online, so it's probably going to be 25, my guess. It's usually hard. Um, just like to, to maximum of turns, 250 over 500, but nobody ever gets to either. Um, each envoy you send to a city state of your majority religion counts as two envoys. That's a really nice one, but even then, it's a little more difficult sometimes to work with but it, no it, it does definitely work must have a majority religion and then we have the golden age and normal age double buff the strength and unity when many making dedications at the beginning of a golden or heroic age you receive the normal age bonus towards improving your score as well, which is obviously incredibly powerful and makes Tamar quite unique. Um, it's often very difficult to avoid a Dark Age after at least one, certainly two Golden Ages. So being able to have that luxury and flexibility is, is really nice. And then, of course, she has some specialist units and specialist walls and so on and so forth. But we're going to be discussing what exactly allowed me to win this religious game and also what struggles I had. Because I'll be honest, moving around a ton of limited use, limited charge apostles over a map that had contained many islands. I always put it on shuffle, but I don't know what that means exactly. Um, if there are certain biases with certain types over others. You can see that we've already met our first neighbor in Grand Colombia. We're gonna have to view of that. But yeah, I hope you enjoy this video and uh, hopefully we'll be able to learn together just how to make this religion work. So the first thing I want to talk about is the fortune that we had in this game. And by that I mean not only a good amount of land to start with, though we had to make our borders fairly clear because they were definitely encroaching. But also the city-states that we got, arguably the two most valuable city-states when you're making a faith-based economy. First we have Valletta, which of course, its suzerainty is that city center buildings and encampment district buildings can be bought with faith. Now, I have to admit, I wasn't really able to utilize this one as much as I'd have liked. And the reason for that, of course, is that I was spending most of my faith building the army of apostles. There's a lot of faith to be spent on apostles, and you need to be able to maximize of that but the second one that i was exceptionally happy to see and was incredibly useful and i'm not sure if i could have won this game without it was of course yerevan now, everybody knows the power of yerevan and just how strong it is your apostle units its susan t can choose from any possible promotion instead of receiving just a random one and because i really needed to make an army that was strong enough to conquer the whole world it meant that i wanted as many of them to be debater with some of them being proselytizers some of them being uh translator the most effective apostles with the best abilities for our aims so the fact that we have found both of these within the first 50 turns in fact probably even earlier than that especially of the latter because it was literally on our continent meant that we could really go into the whole idea of a religious game with open arms and feeling confident that we could actually get this done. Which, to be honest, on an online speed time frame, 
can seem a little daunting. The second thing I'd really like to talk about, was again quite fortuitous for us, is that we have a neighbor. And not only just any neighbor, but if you have a look over here, now that all religions have been taken, well, okay, one is left, but we can see that none of these are Grand Columbia. In fact, throughout the course of this game, Grand Columbia do not get a religion. The fact that they do not defend their own religion, the fact that we can already start on quite a relatively smooth transition to generate more cities with our faith, pushing our religion throughout the map, hoping that they will do too, but actually, we'll see as it turns out, they don't really do much with it. It's really awesome for us because... The whole idea, strategically, is probably to try and convert the cities with least resistance first. Because then the density and religious pressure that you have and gain from that for a relatively small cost is greater than any of the other rival religions that you're competing with. And so as we move throughout this map and we take control of Grand Columbia cities with our religion, it will really give us the perfect footing to then be able to progress into the other civilizations so that we can win this game. Speaking of an expensive apostle army, some of the choices I made for my religion are absolutely key to making sure we can purchase everything that we need. So let's have a look at that. I chose the Pantheon Stone Circles. Now, of course, this is a faith-generating pantheon, which allows us, with the map considering that we have access to Marble, which is a quarry. Gypsum, which is another type of quarry, as well as stone to be able to make quarries. I thought that for this particular game was a really good choice for generating a lot of faith to be able to buy this Apostle Army. In addition, Holy Order, which is quite highly sought after by the AI, so I would advise taking it as one of the first beliefs. Really, really crucial to being able to buy a whole bunch of more apostles for cheaper like the difference between starting apostle prices at like 140 versus 200 and it escalating not as much is huge to be able to actually buy the legions of apostles that i needed in order to get this job done at least like 30 i'd say apostles across the course of the game where i purchased and that really allowed us to maximize the faith that we were generating because even though we have a natural wonder and we build a holy site adjacent to it, even though we have a lot of cities generating faith, it's still a huge demand to be able to purchase the kind of density that we're after. I really like how this game has helped show just how strong Tamar really is. Her strength and unity ability that allows you to cycle from golden to golden age is incredible. And we're about to do so right now. We have one turn remaining and we have just achieved our golden age once again by a small but meaningful two points. It is really interesting the sort of questions that are brought forth when trying to choose what rewards you want from that. Because... You're in a dichotomy between wanting the rewards that are most beneficial to you, but also thinking about the bonuses that you get that are arguably the easiest to use to make it happen again. As you can see here, I didn't choose the most relevant Exodus of the Evangelists uh, choice, and that is because, A, we haven't yet built apostles. Like, we're building our empire. You know, we have eight cities sprawled across our main continent. We're still building our empire. We haven't started yet into building the apostles themselves. And secondly, as you're probably well aware, free inquiry and pen brush and voice are much easier normal age Eriscourse contributors than something like Exodus Evangelist, which obviously you need apostles or at least missionaries, some kind of religious unit, to spread that religion. So while I'm able to chain Golden Ages, I still want to make the opportunity to do so as viable as possible. And once we have established our empire, we will then be able to transition into the actual process of winning the game.
And the next important point I want to make is do not forget wonders. Just because you're not playing a culture game doesn't mean that wonders aren't important, especially how there is a quite a few dedicated religious-based wonders. You know, things like Hagia Sophia. That allows you to get an extra charge on your missionaries and apostles. And I said already, that is incredibly crucial to conserving the amount that you need to spend on your army. Or even Mont Saint Michel, which, while not as important as Hagia, in my opinion, still allows you to benefit from theological combat, the potential of getting some relics, the potential of that giving you more faith, and so on. In addition, this particular game. Petra was certainly a consideration. I end up getting these two tiles, and so it's not the greatest Petra sitting in the world, but there you go. I also got Casa de Concentración. This is really important because actually in a religious game, you do need quite a few governor titles. Like Governor titles are always quite elusive, but I'd say in a religious game, it's even more demanding. I think it's kind of like a lot of win cons, actually, whereby even though you have a win con to go for, a way to win, a lot of the first half of the game is building an empire and building it with that wincon not at the forefront, but in mind. So in this case, building wonders and building cities that will help benefit your overall religious game plan, but not having it necessarily the centerpiece of your empire's progression just yet. Touching back on the importance of wonders, I'd like to point out that we were able to get St. Basil's Cathedral in a beautifully perfect Tundra City for it. A whole bunch of culture and production and such coming from that. Very nice to have there. Mind you, of course, it's only Tundra tiles, not snow tiles, but there's still quite a bit to work with and it can even reach down here for some good value. But the point of this section is to talk more about this guy. I was saying earlier about Casta Concentración and how important and demanding it is to have governor titles in a religious game, and I think one of the big reasons why is Moksha. He was incredibly valuable for me, and the reason why is, of course, if you have a look, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's nice. There is the religious pressure to adjacent cities is 100% stronger from this city, plus two faith for every special district in this city, so it generates faith, it adds pressure, Add strength, ignores religious pressure from others, and so on and so forth. But the big thing here is the patron saint. The apostles and warrior monks trained in the city receive one extra promotion when receiving their first promotion. Which I think is absolutely huge. Because combined with Yerevan, which allows you to actually... take control of what those promotions are. You can make units that have both debater promotion, which gives the crucial buff to theological combat, but also combine it with either proselytizer for the purging of other religions or translator for the strength of applying your own so that you can actually spread your religion at a pretty good rate and save on the amount of possible charges that you need to be using. Welcome, it's fully mid-game here, it's turn 117, and now we're fully ready to make that crucial transition from building our empire to actually swarming and getting control of everybody else's religion. And the reason why is because the final piece is finally in place. We've established our religion, we have all our beliefs, and the most crucial one arguably is the mosque. The reason why is because combined with Hagia Sophia, we now have apostles that can give five total spreads. Remember, these are apostles that have been buffed by particular promotions like debater and translator, and now we are ready to build our army. So as you can see, we've been exploring the map, we've been acquiring our own great people, and we now have our own little chicken and egg story to talk about. It's quite interesting, and it's a little bit of science, so I thought I'd want to share it with you guys. So, what do we have here? Well, one of my favorite great people, 
Sir Matthew Perry. Yes, but not the Friends one, as we spoke about before. Um, he has a really cool ability. His ability is grants enough envoys to become suzerain at a city state. We're going to use it at Vatican. Then removes all other players' envoys. And that's really cool. But what I want to know is when you compare that to Vatican City, which is its sues bonus, and remember you'd have to be sued in order for this to even work. When you activate a great person, which we're about to, Matthew Perry, spend 400 religious pressure of your founded or majority religion to cities within 10 tiles. So, what came first, Matthew Perry or Vatican City? If the game considers Vatican City's sues to come first in terms of checking for what's happening, then it will, before the Matthew Perry ability to sues Vatican City, will check whether you are sues with Vatican City when using Matthew Perry's ability. Since we aren't until Matthew Perry's ability takes effect, it would not spread any religious pressure. However, if it checks Matthew Perry's ability first, Matthew Perry's ability would come into play it would allow us to soothe Vatican City. And then Vatican City's ability, which is when you use a great person, which we just did with Matthew Perry, would take place. And it would say, ah, you have Susan T, and you just used a great person. So it will spread religious pressure. So depending on whether this spreads religious pressure or not, we can determine our own little chicken and egg story. So let's try it. Indeed, there's the 400 barrelism, and even though that didn't change the religion of Vatican City, what we can say to that is that Matthew Perry's Susan ability did indeed come first. And that Vatican City looked at that when, ah, you're sused of us. You have us sused, and you just use a great person. So we're going to have the plus 400 barrelism spread that you just saw pop up there. And now we have suzerainty of three different faith states, which is really good for our economy. As you can see, it's almost 400 now, which will really help us in the long run being able to buy the remaining apostles. Welcome back. You join us in late game now. We already have taken religious domination in the other civilizations at play. And now comes a really important decision to make. I want to be able to have access to be able to buy apostles at any particular time. I don't want that impeded. And the apostles that I want to make obviously are the five charged super apostles with double promotions. However, I have been doing so at this location, Sikhan Valley is or Sikin Valley. I'm not sure how the pronunciation is. You have to forgive me. And that is good up to a point. This world is vast. Not only vast, but we have an island's map, pretty much. There's a lot of different pieces of land. It has been very helpful having that as our base to be able to travel all of this land, be able to spread our religion through Grand Colombia into some but not all of China, even spread it as far as Phoenicia into potentially Gilgamesh's Sumeria as well. And also, it's been good for us to spread throughout um, the Khmer territories as well. But there are other targets, you know, we need to spread throughout the whole world and Quite frankly, while it is good, it has a mosque, it has all that it needs, it's not a particularly great location for everywhere. 
especially since our empire is vast and we could easily relocate to another side of the world and start producing apostles there. A little further away from that, we have a place called Sukumi. And I have decided to move Moksha here. This means that we have turned off effectively purchasing apostles for the next four or so turns. But when this becomes activated, I will now be able to have much better reach spreading to Gitarja's territories, Coupe's territories, and even the remaining China. And that's really important because time is of the essence. It is turn 129. This hasn't started yet, but it will do in the imminent future. As you can see, we already have acquired religious dominance in Simon Bolivar and Jai Varman's territory. But of course, in order to be able to take down coupes, to take down Yongla, and all of that, we're going to need a little bit of a break in order to resume our efficacy in spreading religion. It's a decision you have to consider. Maybe with the movement of apostles, and if you have any roads, this can be traveled from there to here in five turns. If this was all land, and apostles usually are better at traveling over land than sea, but it depends how many movement buffs you have unlocked for your apostles over on water. But even then, the embarking, the disembarking, is going to take effect and, and, and hinder your progress. Maybe this isn't long enough a distance to be making this decision. But I feel that for this game, it is going to benefit us in the long run to reposition, relocate our spawning city to here. You join us in the final turn, which I must say is quite quick compared to a lot of my other newfound games of non-diplo victories. On turn 147, within 150 turns, it's really nice. And I gotta say, I don't think I could have been able to do this without all the things in place. Yerevan being a huge one. Moksha and his promotion, so that with the double promotions and being specifically a combination of, say, proselytizer, debater, and translator that we wouldn't have been able to be as powerful in forcing our religion throughout this rather stretched land. And what's also really strange that I'd like to show off as our final bit is just how abrupt the win con established in a religious game is. In some cases, especially if you win like an aid project for the final diplo points you have to get it to zero turns and then at zero turns it's got even yet another turn that can potentially swing the end result and then you're good with a culture game you achieve that goal your number is greater than the target total you have another turn to wait on that but no matter what happens at the end of that turn you then achieve your victory. In a religious game, if we were to open like this one, as you can see, I have a bit of a delay here. And the delay denotes that this is going to win right on the moment that these apostles die. Instead of waiting a turn or anything like that, it immediately goes into the victory screen. We have a basic need to believe in something greater than ourselves. We crave solace in the darkness. We 
light into our path. Thanks to you, we found meaning amid the cosmos. There it is! Yeah! You see how peculiar it, like, it glitches the game almost. It takes a while for that last apostle to move after I, you know, made the decision. And it kind of like loading the immediate transition from that fight into the victory because it knows at that point it already is enough. It's a very peculiar experience for, you know, a player who hasn't won a religious victory in quite some time. It's kind of like, almost like a foreshadowing of what's going to happen next. Uh, it almost makes you feel like maybe the game is a bit bugged. It's like, no, no break right now. But anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed this religious victory. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like the video if you've enjoyed this. And I look forward to showing more Civ 6 with you guys. And, and hopefully together we can all improve our ability to win games on Deity.